live. In nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus, Santa Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. All right, a couple of a couple of things to start out with. Uh, first, by way of announcement, we will not have class next week because the Eucharistic Congress... Actually, no, we will have class next week. I'm going to leave right after class to go to the Eucharistic Congress. So I'm wrong. There will be class next week. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, okay. No changes or anything like that. But um, you have in front of you, just as a little starting exercise slash, slash demonstration of something we've been talking about, um, the beginning of Matthew's gospel and the genealogy of Christ. Uh, and the type is probably kind of tiny, but it, it, is, in, it is in my book, so uh, look closely. Um, but I wanted to go over a little bit. We've talked about uh, declensions, and that is, that is involved uh, talking about grammatical case, so the function of a word in the sentence. And so here's a fairly simple example of how that's going to work. And I'm going to point out something kind of interesting in this and that it isn't 100% consistent in the text we're looking at. So <clears throat> it begins, Liber Generationis Jesu Christi, the book of generations of Jesus Christ, Jesu Christi. And we're going to talk today, we're going to go over the second declension today, which Christus, Christi, is in the second declension. Fili David, the son of David. Fili Abraham. So already we have something kind of strange in that Jesu Christi, the base form would be Jesus Christus, but we see Jesus Christi because those words have been declined into the genitive to show possession. Um, Fili David, Fili is in the genitive. Um, David, though, is not declined because in Latin, Hebrew names don't always get fully sort of translated. So it's always going to be David. So the nominative nominative of David is David, and the genitive is David, and the uh, dative is David, and the ablative is David, and the accusative is David, and the vocative, which we haven't gone over yet, but the vocative is when you address someone, uh, would also be David. Uh, so, so you'll run into that. So we go through the, this is that fun reading that I like to make the deacon do on Christmas, because then he has to stand there and pronounce all the Hebrew names. I like doing it too, except for in English, when we pronounce these, in Spanish, it's really easy because Spanish has extremely consistent pronunciation. In English, though, um, half of these names we pronounce in heavily anglicized versions, like Abraham, uh, basically gringo Hebrew. And then the other half of them, I know how to pronounce them in Hebrew, but I don't want to sound like a snot. So I try to like chart a middle course between sounding vaguely correct, but also not like overdoing it because overpronouncing your Hebrew is one of the cardinal sins of reading readings and, uh, and preaching. So, <laughs> Abram, Genuit, Isaac, two indeclinable names. Abraham does not become Abramus and Abrami and Abramo and all that, and neither does Isaac. Isaac, Altim, Genuit, Jacob, again, indeclinable. But here we go. Jacob Altum Genuit Udam. So Genuit means to birth or to generate. That's where the word generate comes from. That's where all those genic words in English come from. If someone is photogenic, they like having photos made of them or generated of them. Um, if something is carcinogenic, it, it is a cancer generating thing. <laughs> a cancer-making thing, it literally a cancer-birthing thing, and so on. So when you see that G-E-N uh, particle in a word, that means it's going to make or create or birth. Um, we will translate this as begot in, um, in, in some, some older English translations of, of the genealogy. Uh, in the current lectionary, it says that Abraham was the father of Isaac. But that's not really what the Hebrew says. And that, or, well, it's not what the... It, wasn't, it wouldn't be what the Hebrew says because Matthew's Gospel wasn't written in Hebrew. It's not what the Greek says. And then the Latin that I'm reading you is a translation of the Greek. And so Genuit 
fathered might be a better translation because that's a verb form, but fathered or or begat. Um, I like the word begat because it sounds it sounds you know older. Gets me in touch with my my inner Anglican um, <laughs> to the extent that that exists. But uh, but then you also have um, we actually do say that though in our liturgical usage because in the creed we say begotten not made, genitum non factum which means that the Son of God is Son and has that relationship of a Son to a Father from all eternity, he wasn't created. He wasn't made like a creature. That's another interesting one you'll see pop up a lot in English when you see foc, foc, uh, factum comes from facere, and that means to make. And so whenever you see those those kind of words, that, that F-A-C particle shows up in our English words as... as making something. So manufacture is to make with your hands, even though almost everything now that we describe as manufactured is not made by human hands, which is really bizarre. <laughs> I'm going to slide this back a little bit because I'm currently headless. <clears throat> and I don't want to freak out the people at home any more than I already am by going over grammar. <laughs> but then we go on, Jacob Alt, so, so Jacob Altum Genuit Udam at Fratres Eus. Jacob was the, Jacob begat Judah and his brothers, but then it becomes Judas, because Judas is the subject of the next sentence. So he was Udam when he was receiving the action of being fathered, but now he's going to father. Judas altum, altum means but or and, it's sort of a connector here. And Judas and Judah was the father of or fathered Phares. At Saram de Tamar. So, but then it says, and Fares is not declined either. Altum Genuit Esron. Esron is also not declined. Altum Genuit Aram. Aram. We have several here that are not declined. We go down to verse six. David. David Altum Rex Genuit Solomonem ex aeque fuit Uriae. Solomon, so Solomonem receives the action of the sentence. Solomon is the subject of the next sentence. Altum genuit roboam. Roboam altum genuit abiam. And abiam, we can see, is declined there. Abiam is in the accusative because abiam is the object of the sentence. Roboam uh, fathers abiam, or fathered because this is in the past. Abias then becomes the subject of the sentence. Altum genuit Asa. Asa is not declined. Asa altum genuit Yosefat. Yosefat is not declined. Uh, it's, it's interesting that there's a whole series of generations here. If you look at the next set from verse 12 on, none of them are declinable names, that they're all just in their original Hebrew form. But I want to point that out because that's it gives you a better concept of why we transform the endings of the words, that we can talk about them in terms of nominative, accusative, whatever, in the technical terms, but here's how that shows up. Um, so look for things like that. Look at, one, one thing I would advise, like anytime I've attempted to learn a language, one of the first books I buy is a Bible. And like I said, the Vulcan is a little expensive, but you can actually find, you can find the whole thing online in various places. It's been in the public domain for several centuries. Uh, so you can, you can find the Vulcan online. I would recommend finding biblical passages you're familiar with. Um, and I'll print out a few that I know everybody probably knows pretty well things like the 23rd Psalm, uh, parts of the book, like the very beginning of the book of Genesis, and just look through it and identify the words that are familiar to you, and then think about sentence structure and think about what's the subject of the sentence, what is the verb, what is receiving the action of the verb. We're, all, we're going back here to first grade grammar, um, but, but go to those texts and look and see, here's a text I may be familiar with. If you are familiar with... Um, other texts, too, outside of the Bible, uh, you can actually get a lot of children's books in Latin. Uh, and and if, you just, if you just go on Amazon and look for Latin children's books, um, Dr. Seuss has been done into Latin, which is a little terrifying because of all the words Dr. Seuss made up. Um, I have Alicia in Terra Mirabili, Alice in Wonderland, which I'm scared to read because I'm also scared to read it in English. Um, you can get Winnie Ile Pooh. <laughs> if you would like to read Winnie the Pooh in Latin, um, it's in its, I think, 20th edition right now. Um, and, and it's actually been the subject of a lot of scholarship um, because there, there's, there's a debate that sometimes goes on of should we bother with things like that? Like why translate 
you know, why translate our modern books into ancient languages that nobody speaks anymore? Um, you can buy, I think, five of the Harry Potter books in Latin and two of them in Koine Greek. Uh, and and there's, there are many others like that. So why do that? And the idea is that it, it keeps us, it actually gives us sort of a living experience of what we would call a dead language. It gives us the ability to take our sort of present conditions and think through them in an ancient way. And there's a real anthropological value to that. And so there's actually been a lot of articles written on books like Winnie Le Pou about, first off, the fact that it's a brilliantly done translation. That even the poetry, because, you know, in, in the original Winnie the Pooh, there's a lot of songs and things. The poetry is actually rendered into Latin in a way that both accurately translates it and is faithful to how to do the rhyme and the meter and things in Latin. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's absolutely genius. I highly recommend getting a copy of Winnie Le Pooh, and I will probably bring you pages of it, too. Um, I actually spent a semester of directed study in college doing nothing but translating chapters out of Winnie Le Pooh uh, when I did... <coughs> I showed up for my third semester of Latin, and nobody else, they, they, there, were, there were only six people on the roster. Three of them dropped it before the first class. The other two dropped it after the first class, so it was just me. So I did a directed <laughs> study on Winnie the Pooh. I believe that. <laughs> we started with Cicero, and we got about five minutes into that, and all the words in Cicero are this long. And the professor's like, you don't seem to be enjoying this. And I'm like, well, he said, okay, let's read something else. And he pulled it off the shelf. And I actually had a copy anyway that my uncle had given me. So, all right. Speaking of having fun, let's move on to, oh, yeah. I've also given you this little Latin pronunciation card. Um, this can be helpful to you. Keep it in your purse. Yeah, keep it in your, keep it in your purse, your pocket. Or I use, I'm using mine as a bookmark in my Latin book. Um but it tells on one side, it's got all the consonant pronunciation. On the other, it actually has a little bit of an explanation of uh, the fact that this is liturgical Latin. Because um, I, I had the question of, um, we say this word, chelum, because we pronounce this as an A sound. But if you took Latin in the in, back in the Dark Ages in high school, <laughs> yeah. this is actually going to sound more like... Kylum. Yeah, this is not a ch, this is a, an I sound instead of an A sound. And the reason for that is that's classical pronunciation or reconstructed pronunciation. Um, but this, we're, we're using ecclesiastical pronunciation because at least in the, for the purposes of using Latin in the church, that's going to be more relevant to us. Every now and then you run across a priest who didn't learn ecclesiastical pronunciation and who says mass in Latin with the, uh, with the reconstructed pronunciation and it makes your ears bleed, and it makes the baby Jesus cry, and it should never be done. It's it's you're, you're sitting there you're sitting there, and you hear a knocking coming from up around the altar, and you realize it's the Lord trying to kick down the door of the tabernacle and escape. I suppose there could be worse abuses of the liturgy than using uh, using reconstructed pronunciation in your Latin, but we won't go there. All right. What's that? Pig Latin. Pig Latin, yeah. Oh, yeah. But what if you did Latin in Pig Latin? So you had Pig Latin, Latin. Oh, we ought to do that. Latin, Pig Latin. No, we ought not to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. First off, it would obscure the meanings of the transformations of the words. All right. Lesson two. We're going to look today at the second declension. The rule for that is all nouns that end in the I in the genitive singular belong to the second declension. Um, if they end with us, er, or, or ear. In the nominative singular, they are masculine. If they end in um, they are neuter. So here are the endings. We're going to use the word servus as our model. Servus means a servant or a slave but a, a male one. This is a masculine word. Servi. Well, go to the female we then. Servant. Yes. And it would be in the first declension. Yep. Yep. So Servus. Be in the first declension. Another thing, another thing you would have done if you took Latin in high school and used classical pronunciation, this would not be servus, it would be servus. Because the V would be pronounced like a W. But again, as a friend of mine once put it, I have a hard time believing that the one of the greatest generals in history um, looked out over the battlefield and said, Winnie, Weedy, Winky. Winky. 
We, we, I have a book of um, Latin hymns from the breviary that on the facing page has like a, a kind of a non-poetic translation, actually a very literal translation. So it actually was a bit of a bust me buying that book. Also the fact that it makes this, it actually spells it with a W and it's, it makes my, it makes my it eyes bleed looks, to read it. It looks silly. Yes. Anyway, we don't know what Kaiser actually said there. Yeah. He might have said Veni, he might have said Wenny, we're not really sure. Um, anyway, Servus, here in the con here in the loving arms of Mother Church, we're going to pronounce our Latin in a way that sounds dignified. Servus, servi, servo is the dative. So the servant or a servant, of the servant or of a servant, for the servant, servum. Wouldn't it be to the servant, too? Dative, yeah. Dative can be to or for. Kind of in the direction of. Toward. Yeah. Servum, so that's what's going to receive the action. So I flogged the servant. Servum. Write that in Latin. <laughs> Servo. Well, like I said, if we were if we were if we were doing if we were doing an introduction to to classical Latin and we were reading classical texts, then we'd be talking about how you know the barbarians overran the city and things like that. Yeah, but right. so we're going to read nice things like yeah. church stuff. Yeah. Church stuff until we until we get into excommunicating people and things like that. Oh, that that's another thing. Later on, when we we get more and more advanced, I'll bring in selections from the Roman ritual, including the rite of excommunication. Oh, that's, in, that, scene, that scene from Beckett where they put the candles out on the floor and then, and you watch that you watch that and you're like oh wow this is just all inspiring this is amazing we should we should do things like that and then as a pastor you watch that and go man it's gonna take a long time to get the wax off the floor yeah. <laughs> all right so servus everybody servus servi servo servum servo do the uh endings of the dative and the ablative always agree? Are they the same? It's not true of everything. In the, every, every, every case except for the fourth. Yeah, every, every declension except the fourth declension, yeah. All right, the plural. Serva. The nominative. The servants. Servorum. Yeah, you're yeah. right. I'm looking at the neuter. Yeah. It's actually servum. Oh. I'm wrong. Servum. Yeah, the servants. Servorum. Of the servants. You're going to see the orum and the arum a lot because of is an extremely common construction in every language. So it's possessive. Anything that possessive or any, anything that would be rendered as of. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, it's still Servi, Father, not Servi. yeah, you're right. I'm looking at the wrong thing. What am I looking at? Oh, there we go. Uh, okay. Yeah. Servi, you're right. Servi. So this is why in English, when we um, we, we sometimes do it jokingly, but it, it's actually kind of correct. What is the plural of cactus? Uh, cacti. What's the plural of octopus? Octopi. Yeah. So that's that's where that comes from. Because we could put octopus here, octopus, octopi, octopo, octopum, octopo, octoporum. <laughs> and then servis, servos, servis. Ceviche. That is interesting. Ceviche. Yep. Servi, servorum. So the servants, it can't be a servants. That's always going to be in the, that's always going to be translated with a definite article, even though definite articles don't exist in Latin. Um, the servants are doing something. Um, of the servants, two or four the servants, something acting upon the servants. The octopus eats the servants. <laughs> and then the ablative is going to be anything that has a preposition in front of it, more or less, except for of and well, of is not a preposition, but for. Sure, yeah, it is. That's right, yeah. Is, yeah. 
the, the two, like the dative, dative and the ablative are the plural, but with the same. This is the, plural. Yeah. This is singular. Yep. Yeah. But I mean, down here, when you, in the dative. Yeah. And the, the endings for the, so us, e, o, um, o. Yeah, but they're the, I guess they're the same, is what I'm saying. So I yeah, yeah, get yeah. it in the, the context. The and the ablative, yeah, are going to oh, be the okay. same in, okay. in both of these, yeah. And that's because they have similar functions. Oh. When you see the data out by itself, it's going to be translated as four. But then almost any other preposition, it's going to be with the ablative. Oh, okay. It's usually kind of a, a, a case of position. Okay, yeah. And most prepositions, so... so Above the servant, under the servant, beside the servant, near the servant, behind the servant. Mm -hmm. I put. Yeah. The servant. How about against the servant? Mito, ego, mito, gladium, <laughs> meum, ex servo, in servo. I put my sword into the servant. So. This is how grammar works. Yeah. <laughs> so what happens when you say classical languages? It's all incredibly violent. Um, <laughs> I could speak Yodis, I guess we could learn. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. Like I said, we could put those words in any order and it yeah. still mean the same thing. You know, you can drop the ego just like in in Spanish. That was yeah. one of the most annoying things in the world about learning French is that French yeah. is just like English and that you have to have the pronouns in yeah. front of the in front of the nouns. And now it's even more annoying because you might mess up the pronouns. And offend somebody and get canceled, but but you can skip the pronouns because this tell this tells you that I'm the one doing it. If you were doing it, it would be mitas. If we were doing it, it would be mitamus. Yeah, that saves on words. If if I am exhorting you to put your sword into the servant, then I'm going to say mitamus. Let us put our sword into the servant. But then I've changed mayum to nostrum. You know. That's what's going on there. Let's, yeah, this is this is weird. We're putting our swords into the servants. Yeah. Let's find let's find something more more. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Clean. All right. <laughs> we're going to leave our paradigm up here because we're going to now look at neuter words that are not masculine or feminine. These are the ones that are going to end in an M. So we use renum. Actually, let's use chelum because we've already talked about that today. Chelum is neuter. That means heaven or the sky. The um is what makes it different here. That's what marks off that it's neuter, even though it's in the second declension, but everything else is going to be the same. Cheli. Chelo. Che Lum, Che Lo. And in the plural, this is going to be Che La, the heavens. You're going to see Che Lorum a lot. Che Lis. Chela, Chelis. Regina Chely. We also hear Mary referred to as uh, Yanua Chely, the gate of heaven. That's an I. It could also be a J in medieval Latin, but we're not going to do that because it looks weird. Given that this is not an actual like, like class that you can take for credit in any kind of accredited institution, most of the decisions like that are going to be based on what I think looks weird and not on any actual technical professional reasons. So caveat emptor, as it were, let the buyer beware. Just remember how much you paid for this Latin class and know that you're going to get your money's worth. Yeah. All right. So there are a lot of good words. We'll, uh, We'll look at a few of them here in the second declension. So we already talked about servus. Here's one that's, that ought to be familiar to us, deus. 
If you want to render Deus into your declensions here, you're going to say Deus, Dei. So the, the, the base is Dei because the I tells us that's you, you're going to get your base from the genitive. So Dei, Deo, Deum, Deo. If you go over here and put it into the plural, then you're committing heresy. <laughs> But you'll need to know at some point that, that there are, you do have to render it into the plural if you're talking about um, you're talking about other gods, which the scriptures make reference to. And that's going to be rendered a little bit differently because Deus is not the most regular. Oh, yeah, actually it would be. Um, so you'd have Dei. Deor, Deor, no, it's D, isn't it Deorum? Yeah, that's right, because it's not E, it's an I. Dei. Deorum, Deis. It transforms their for ease of pronunciation, basically. Uh, and then you will be in a lowercase lower D. <laughs> I should be, yes. So I'm not committing heresy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, yeah, so we're, we're, we'll, we'll skip the heresy for today. Um, other words, apostolus, we already know that one. Apostolus. Inimicus, that's a that's one that has a cognate in English, even though it doesn't look like it. Enemy. 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 Yes. With friends like this, who needs anemones? <laughs> Some neuter words, renum, chalum. Kingdom. Principium. Renium is a kingdom. A kingdom is ruled by a rex regis, a king. We're not to that. That's the third declension. We're not there yet. Chelum is going to be sky or heaven, as I said. Principium is the beginning. So think about how a principle with a PLE is the sort of first rule for thinking about something. A moral principle would be the first thing we consider when evaluating the morality of something. A principal, P-A-L, is going to be the person in charge of the school or whatever. Um, but it's the first person. That's going to follow the Greek arche. So when you see arch in something, it means the same thing. In the um, and I think the I think sometimes the Vulgate will just directly translate that because it's easy or just directly transliterate that into Latin. So the um, in the wedding at Cana, the head waiter in Greek is the arche triklonos. He's the head of the dining hall. The triklonos being the dining hall, and in Latin it just says he's the arche triclinium. So he's the he's the chief of the dining hall. We should, that, that's what we should retitle the position of the parish life coordinator because most of what they do isn't here. They're the, the RK Triclonos. <laughs> Call him the Archie Guy in the seminary. There you go. <laughs> yeah. That's just a little side note in case you venture into Greek. If we have enough demand, I might attempt to teach Greek, but I don't know how well that will go because we all see how well this is going. Greek. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now the most exciting moment thus far, we're going to actually learn a verb. We're going to actually learn two verbs at once because they are transformed identically. They're also irregular and they are two of the most important verbs in the Latin language. Because naturally the most important things are going to be the weirdest ones. That's certainly true of our religion. Why would it not be true of the language of our church? All right, when you see a verb written in a dictionary entry or something, it's going to have usually four forms listed for it. We're only concerned about one of those right now, well, two of those right now. You're going to see the first person singular, uh, the first person singular form, which for the verb we're looking at right now, we have first person, second person, third person, is going to be sum. And then you're going to also see next to that, usually when they're listed, you'll see the 
infinitive form, which is the to form. Essay means to be. It's extremely important because A, it's the most common verb in just about every language, except for the languages where it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in the Semitic languages, strangely enough. Um, and we'll actually learn what, how that works because Latin will use a similar construction at times too. You can actually put two words side by side, not put this between them and still have a complete sentence because of how the declension, like how the case endings make them connect. Sum, so ego sum, I am. You don't have to use the pronouns, the personal pronouns in Latin, like Spanish. Um, the endings tell you what the, the word is. So sometimes you'll see ego sum and sometimes you'll just see sum. If I say parocus sum, I am the pastor. But I could also say ego sum parocus. Or I could say ego parocus sum, or I could say sum parocus ego. Depending, yeah. If I'm writing poetry, I'm going to change the word order to fit the meter of the rhyme I'm going for. <laughs> I don't say parocum, I say parocus because it's a predicate nominative. And I don't, that's as far as I can go with explaining that because I don't have a degree in English. <laughs> okay, so ego sum to s you are you are so I look at no a and say no a seminaris seminarista s no a you are a seminarian ne obliviscaris to s then est is going to be our third person. He, she, or it is. It's going to be is, a, uh, id, but that's not really important right now. We're most often going to use that for um, for for talking about a, you know, a, a noun instead of a pronoun there. So that would be where I say no a est seminaris. Day, um, seminarista. Yeah, actually, that would still be predicate nominative, wouldn't it? So, I wouldn't, yes, seminarista. Seminarista, yeah, I wouldn't have to decline that. Sum s est. This is our singular. Go over here for plural. Nos sumus. In uh, Prairie Home Companion by Garrison Keillor, the town motto of Lake Wobegon is sumus quod sumus, we are what we are. <laughs> if I were getting together with Father Buckler and Father Bond um, and Father Asik and Father Voidus, then we could say sacerdote sumus, we are priests. Next is going to be vos, y'all. Estes, y'all are. I'm going to say y'all because Abbot Placid, when he taught me Latin many, many years ago, that was what he did to distinguish between the U singular and the U plural. <laughs> English lost that distinction a long time ago. Funny little note there. We could also accurately translate this as thou are, thou art, and you are. Because in English, that used to be the distinction. The and thou were not formal. They were actually informal singular uses. And over time, we came to use you for all of it because you was more formal. And so you would use the plural form to indicate formality, even in speaking to an individual. Similar to how we have what's called the royal we, where a monarch will address himself in the plural. We decree this, this, or this. Popes actually do that, too. If you go read Pope Benedict's encyclicals in Latin, everywhere that in English they're translated in the singular. We go look at all the verbs, and they're all in U.S. forms because he is speaking in the royal we, in the plural of majesty. But you would use the plural to refer to, some, to even an individual formally. And in English, we just drop that distinction, and we say you are or you plural are, and it's not clear, which is why when people think, and I, and I explain this to New Yorkers coming through the narthex 
all the time that y'all is actually a very intelligent construction because we lost something, so we had to compensate for it. And, and a lot of regional dialects do that. To compensate for the loss of this distinction in English, we now say things like y'all, or God help us if you're from Pittsburgh, yins, <laughs> which honestly can be spelled in any letters known to man. So sum s est sumus estis y'all are. So I could say discipuli estis. Y'all you you are students. And then sumus estis sunt. Sunt is going to be our plural. I'm going to erase my sentences here so you can see the verb a little more clearly. Because this is the most vitally important verb in Latin, not only because we say is, am, are, was, and were a lot, but also because this is going to be helpful for, this is going to be essential to forming another grammatical structure, construction in the perfect tense on down the road. <clears throat> Sum es est, sumus estis, sunt. I am, you are, he, she, or it is, we are, y'all are, they are. Notice how in English we have to have the pronouns because those words not only, so we talk about endings being the same, we literally do that all the time in English. I have to say I am, because I can't just say am. Mm -hmm. Even though grammatically speaking, that's the only time that we say am, but yeah. is, is, are, are, are. So we have to have the pronouns to distinguish what's going on here, whereas in Latin you don't because you, you already know by the endings who's doing what. All right, we're now going to, I'm going to only erase the pronouns here because I need to be able to write in front of them because this is going to be really easy. The next verb we're looking at just builds on the verb we just learned. So this is the verb for to be. We're now going to do the, word, the verb for to be able. Can. This one's also vitally important just because, again, it's an extremely common word. I'm going to write it in blue just to show you. So the, you know, I said when, when we see this list in a dictionary, it's going to have four forms. We're only concerned with two of them right now, but we'll get to the others later. But the singular, uh, first person singular is posum. Not possum, that has an O at the beginning. That's going to mean I am able. Now it's not going to be possesse, it's going to kind of collapse into posse. So to be able is posse. Awesome. Yeah. Non audire te possum, I can't hear you. This is usually going to be coupled with an infinitive. So again, when I said non, Audire, audire is to hear, te, you, posum, I am not, I am not able to hear you. So you're going to have a to form in there, to hear. The second, the second person singular, potes. Mm. And that's going to be important because, again, this is where we're going to get our construction from. That's usually going to come from the second person. Though this is an irregular verb, so it's going to be a little bit different. Again, you know, we take the two most, two of the most vitally important words in the whole language, and we make them really weird, weird and inconsistent to conjugate. By the way, key word there. That's what we call declension. To decline is what you do to nouns and adjectives. This is conjugation. Conjugation. The the this is a good Latin word. Con is with the yugation part. This part means to yoke. So this is telling us what people were yoking together by means of the verb. Posum, potes, potest. 
Sometimes you'll look at old prayer books that were, or theological books or any kind of books that had to be approved by church authority, and you'll see what's called an imprimatur. You'll sometimes also see if the book was written by a religious, imprimi potest. It's a, it's a distinction there. Imprimatur means may it be printed, um, and that's for diocesan clergy and lay theologians writing books, and it's granted by the bishop. And imprimi potest is granted by a religious superior and it means it can be printed. <clears throat> In primi potest. So posum, potest, potest. Hold it too far away, you're not going to see it. Posumus, you notice there's an accent there at the beginning to tell us how to pronounce that. Posumus, we can. Bob the Builder, can we fix it? Posumus. Seek, Posumus. Yes, we can. Potestis. Y'all can. Vos potestis. Y'all are able, or y'all can and posumed. They are able, or they can. So yeah. So basically, if you can figure out sum ss, sum sst sum, you can also figure out posum, potest, potest, posumus, potestis, posumed. Like I said, it's going to change a little bit um, because this is not a regular verb. And the reason we know it's not a regular verb is that the infinitive form doesn't have an R in it. Infinitives, and we're going to get into these here in the next chapter, I believe. Homo hominis. I think in the next chapter. No, there are no verbs in the next chapter. How sad. Uh, lesson four is when we will get into regular verbs. But a uh, good example, the one that's in the book actually, is laudere. So if you're familiar with the Romance languages, you know that um, you're going to have an E-R, A-R, I-R ending, and that's the same in Latin, except it's ere. So that means to praise, and then we would transform it. But the, the pattern is a little bit different because, like I said, this is a, an irregular verb. But that's fine. We memorize those first two irregular verbs, and the world can be our oyster. Mundus potest oyster. I don't know how to say oyster in Latin. I don't know that that exists. Oyster. <laughs> Oyster. Oyster. I say that to people from England, and then they're like, well, why should I care if I have an extra swipe card for the subway? It would help if I were looking in the English to Latin part of this dictionary and not the Latin to English part. That doesn't exist. It just assumes you know what you're doing. That's a tall assumption, book. All right. Google translates Okay. I already forgot what I was talking about, so. Oysters. Yes, oysters, right. All right. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about the cognates in the exercises for unit one. Um, and, and I'm going to, you know, we're three classes in now. So um, this week, before the next class, look at the exercises for unit two. And, um, and try those out on your own, and we'll go over them next time. But for unit one, we have another thing of cognates. I love when it does this, because this is one of the best ways to learn a language, is to just learn what's in common. Basically, I figured out over the years that the way they teach you languages in high school, which is actually kind of how I'm teaching this, but this is, you know, this is how we're going, you know, how we kind of have to do it given our, our circumstances. But you don't just memorize a bunch of charts and then, then speak a language. That's not how any of us learn to speak our first language, that you learn it by imitating. And you learn it by basically learning how to spell. That's why the hooked on phonics approach is about 80% good. Um, it can be problematic in some other ways, but the idea is that you learn to kind of guess at how to spell and pronounce things. And most of the time, if you kind of know how to, if you learn how to guess, you're going to be right. The first couple of years that I was actually able to speak Spanish in a conversation, I wasn't actually speaking Spanish. I was making up what I thought Spanish should say right there. And about 80% of the time I was right. So if you just learn kind of the base patterns and then make it up, you'll get it. Because that's how all of us, I mean, that's how all of us speak anyway. 
um, that you're not when you when when you're speaking to me in a conversation, you're not sitting there pulling from a word list. You're saying what the next thing should be. And if you and, and so being fluent in a language just means being a really good guesser in some sense. So cognates are going to be extremely helpful because if we know what particles of words mean, then it becomes easier to kind of pick the right thing or derive the right meaning from things that look similar. So when we see the word anniversarius, what does that mean? Anniversary. Anniversary. And it comes from a word that we learned, I think, last time. It's, in the, it's been in there. Anus means year. So the anniversary is the observance of a, another year lapsing. It can be the anniversary of your marriage. It can be the anniversary of your birth. But it just means another year has come around. Voluntarius. Volunteer. Volunteer. It's a noun. Volunteer. Volunteer. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Just like necessarius. Necessary. Legionarius. Legionary. Contrarius. Exactly. That's a good word. Mysterium. That's going to be important to Christian Latin because the Greek word mysterion is the word that in Latin becomes sacramentum or sacrament. That, that a sacrament is a mystery. And that's why at the beginning of Mass, we say, let us prepare ourselves to celebrate these sacred mysteries. It's referring explicitly to the sacrament. Remedium. Remedy. Remedy. Testimonium. 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 Studium. Study. Here's a fun one. Colloquium. Colloquium. Which we now call a colloquium anyway. So yeah. <laughs> every year the diocese has two events for priests. There's a colloquium and a convocation, and I don't remember the difference. But one year they, they'll alternate. Like one year we have a convocation, which is also a Latin word. Vocare means to call. Like a vocation is a calling. A convocation is to call together. Um, so, so we have a convocation one year and then a colloquium the next year. And I don't remember the difference, except one of them is two days long and one of them is three days long. And I don't remember which is which. And I also have only ever been to like one of them. So. I doubt they have a difference. There, there is a difference. It's just a difference that completely doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> a distinction without a difference, which could be the motto on the coats of arms of most dioceses and other ecclesiastical institutions. Subsidium. Subsidium. Subsidy. That's a good vocabulary word for 2022 and uh, various Subsidium. governmental affairs. English. Augurium. Augury. Augury. Yes, if we're going to dismember small animals, and read their entrails to give us the future, that's what that's 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 what's going on there. We're not going to do that because that would be heretical and dangerous. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say, yeah, YouTube just demonetized this video, so I don't think we were monetized to begin with, so it doesn't matter. Matrimonium. Matrimony. Seminarium. No A twitches as I say that word. It contains the that root in there, semen, which means seed, because it is meant to be a seed bed for growing new priests. Now we actually have some sentences. Let's figure out the meaning of these. Sentences. It says at the bottom, by the way, there's a footnote in Latin, the usual order of words is subject, object, or predicate complement, and then the verb. Usually. That is sometimes true. Usually. So the first true. sentence, servus bonus est. What is a servus? Servant. servant. Bonus is good. Est. Is. So the servant is good. Yep. We could also say est servus bonus. We could say bonus est servus. We could say... Servus bonus est or servus est bonus, and it would all mean the same thing. And you would have to use context to figure out what was going on, especially if, since bonus and servus are declined the same way, it looks like there's two subjects to the sentence, but there isn't really. It's, um, I guess you'd have to, I guess you'd have to be careful with order because bonus est servus 
can mean the servant is good. It can also mean the good is the servant, um, which would be strange. But I guess context can give you that. <clears throat> filii boni esse posunt. So filii sons. 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 Yep. Because we talk, we 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 know that one because we say in nomine patri set filii. Fili boni esse posum. The good sons are able, can do. The sons are able, because posum is plural. The sons are able, esse boni. To be good. To be good. Oh, the sons. Oh, the good. Yeah. Oh, you have to use the sons are, not the good sons. Yeah. The sons are able to be good. Yep. This one's not a complete sentence, but sancti supostulis. Holy the holy apostles. In the old rite, when you would say the confidior, the I confess, Sancti Apostolis Petro et Paolo, I confess to the holy apostles Peter and Paul. Beate Marie. Blessed Mary. Blessed Mary, but what? Maria. That's going to be either genitive or dative. Of the blessed, of the blessed Mary, or for the blessed Mary. Oh. Although I suppose that could be plural if there are multiple Marys and they're all blessed. But I mean, that actually is true because there's like no fewer than seven people in the Gospels named Mary. So there's actually a whole Wikipedia article telling you how to distinguish between the various Marys that pop up in the Gospels. I spent I spent hours combing over that one time because I was I was giving a talk on the passion narratives and it's not clear who is standing at the foot of the cross because there could be as many as like 12 people um, because there's so many Marys. Does that come in a card thing? <laughs> no, we should have civil. Little... <laughs> That's right up there with when I was in college, you know, that we, we were reading one time, me and my roommates were reading about because we were theology majors, which meant we didn't really study. Um, we watched King of the Hill reruns. And um, we were sitting around one night, though, probably about two in the morning, because this is when these conversations happen. And we were reading about how there are three different churches that claim to have the head of John the Baptist. So we decided that none of them are being inauthentic, that John the Baptist actually had three heads. And where we arrived at that was the fact that pagan mythology very often had kind of a shadow of the truth to it. So the Severus was actually John the Baptist. Um, and we figured out then that, that that's that's the logical conclusion there. Other than the fact that it's completely ridiculous. Yeah, it was three in the morning, so we're <laughs> Gloria Chaley. That's going to be number nine there. Gloria Chaley. Glorious heaven. Glorious heaven. Heaven is glorious. Wait, that's glorious. Glory in heaven? The glorious heavens. Well, we have heavens, yeah. Glory. Glorious heavens. Heavens. Actually, glory, glory A would be plural. So the glories, Kaylee, of heaven. The glories of heaven. Ad Dei Gloriam. To, to the glory of God. To, glory God. to those of you who were educated in Jesuit institutions, oh. you'll see AMDG plastered on every flat surface. Ad Maiorum Dei Gloriam, to the greater glory of God. But those of you who went to Belmont Abbey, you'll see U-I-O-G-D written on things, which is ut in omnibus glorificator Deus, that in all things God may be glorified. Because that's the motto of Belmont Abbey College. Yeah, I was about to say, and I think the it's never been clear to me because there's two coats of arms floating around there, one of which is the monastery, one of which is the first abbot, and then it's never been clear to me what was supposed to be what because it's not used consistently. Terra Beata Est. You go to the top of Mount Jefferson, you stand on the rocks and you look out and you say, Terra Beata Est. The, the land, land of the apostles. The land is blessed. A blessed. That now, if you said Terra Montane or Terra Montanarum Beata Est, the land of the mountains is blessed. But only if I stand there with the Roman ritual and bless it. Have trouble remembering blessed and blessed. And it's the same you. thing. I know, but I mean, literally, have to look it up when I'm going to read it. Or it oh, comes up. To it doesn't matter. It does oh. <laughs> Do whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. Always true. <laughs> There's there are some places where I will like when I'm chanting, I'll do one or the other, just depending on which fits rhythm, the yeah. fits the cadence better. There's one of the prefaces that. It says all the redeemed praise you, but that's really awkward. So I actually pronounce it all the redeemed praise you. 
Yeah. I, I sort of lightly add another syllable in there because it's easier to say and to sing that way. Yeah. So yeah, whichever whichever sounds better. Okay. Do whatever you want. Whatever you like. I'm free. I can do what I want. Number 23, Maria et Lucia Beate Sunt. Maria et Lucia Mary Beate Sunt. Mary and Lucy are blessed. Mary and Lucy are blessed. Oh, or blessed. <laughs> Maria cum Lucia est. So remember that Maria is with Lucy. Sorry. Right. Maria is with Lucy. Cum is with. <clears throat> All right. Any questions? Because we're about, about done on time here. <laughs> that's that's opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Is that your signal to stop? <laughs> no, actually. <laughs> yeah, that's the I, I always I always love it at One mass. Guys. I, mean, I, I don't I don't like when phones go off at mass, but I love when they go off at very opportune times. Like somebody's somebody's ringer is like a bell. Yeah, like okay. I'll elevate the host, especially like a daily mass. If I don't have a server, they don't elevate the host. And there's bells. I'm like, oh, See, like one time you were doing it, and the bells went off outside, and yeah. you were yeah. doing it. I was like, oh, I cracked up. I, cr I crack up when that happens. Some sometimes at the Spanish mass, I nail it just right to where the homily is exactly the right length that it pushes the first elevation, the elevation of the host to when the eight o'clock bell rings. Like, the like, homily has to be like exactly 16 minutes for that to happen. I was like, dang, that's a good time. Yeah. yeah. What are your usual or, homilies? It depends. Oh. In at the Spanish mass, it kind of depends because I do it in both English and Spanish. So my it will be a little shorter than what I do at the English mass, so that I'm not because I mean if I give a 15 minute homily at the English mass, if I then do that both in English and Spanish. That's going to be half an hour of homily. Yeah. So what I usually do is I give about a 12-minute homily in Spanish and then a five-minute summary in English. And my English, when I do that, comes out in English that's not good English, but it is good Spanish because I just said the thing in Spanish. And so I'm there translating from memory what I just said. And I'm not actually just saying the thoughts. I'm <laughs> translating the Spanish words. So my grammar is all over the place. But, yeah. <laughs> just guess. It might be like, <laughs> has anyone ever said anything to you? I no. don't like your grammar. <laughs> No. Father. Nobody's paying that close attention yeah. to my grammar. So, all right, yeah. Gloria Patria et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Amen. And then reflexively.